Hi guys, my name is Greg Corpanitas and welcome to the Revo PT Podcast. It's brought to you by Revolution Performance Training. I'm an avid trainer and fitness coach who strives to learn the very best in the world of health and fitness. Join me each episode as we speak to game changers in their chosen fields, sharing their story of passion and success. For all podcast related things, please please subscribe and check us out on RevoPT forward slash podcast. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to episode 114 of the Your Revolution podcast, where I'm joined on the line all the way from Montreal, Quebec, Canada, Jonathan Chainberg. Welcome to the Your Revolution podcast. How you doing? Good to be here. Yeah, no, great to have you. Uh, first, before we get stuck into this uh, discussion, how is everything going on your side of the world? Uh, I'm guessing it's the same as everywhere, you know, lockdown, uh, quarantine, uh, businesses closed, schools closed, so it's... Uh... It's a big change. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Very much the uh, same here. So I guess before we get started, would you be able to give our listeners a little bit of an introduction into, I suppose, yourself and uh, I suppose what got you into fitness? Um, I was always uh, athletic. My father played professional hockey and uh, I never really saw um, that I had potential. So they invited me, you know, within months to... uh, at that point, it was called the well. It's still called the Montreal Wrestling Club, mm-hmm. which is uh, where all the high-level wrestlers from the area and around, you know, Canada would go. Plus, we had guys like Gia Sasuri, um, You know, we had we had high-level Georgians and Russians that would uh, that were part of this club. So it was mm-hmm. the, the highest level of wrestling in Canada. Mm-hmm. And um, under Victor Zilberman, you know, I I you know had a, a huge passion for it right away, mm-hmm. and um, well, it just took off for me where I. You know, I, I, I'm a decent athlete, um, and my work level is, is very, very high. So I was able to pick up a lot in a short period of time just off work ethic alone. But, you know, that, that couldn't take me to that, that next level. Mm. And then obviously the combination of the injuries or concussions as well. Obviously that would have made it a bit tougher too, I imagine. Yeah, I would like to see what would, would have happened. You know, it's um, I took it up pretty late, but a lot of guys that I that I beat at that that young age turn you know turn into uh, you know they were on the national team, they went to the world championships. They, so it would have been nice to to see if I would have seen it through. But mm. um, I'm actually happy with the way uh, my life turned out and, and took me in this direction. And I, I probably wouldn't have gotten to this point if it if I would have stayed in wrestling and, and sort of uh, grinded it out. Mm. No, absolutely. Now, as a wrestler myself, probably the, I guess the thing that drew me to it was, I suppose, the, I guess, the purity of it and I suppose the rules and how, it, you know, it was always, you know, one, you know, you versus me. Uh, I suppose, I, like you, I think I, play, I played a lot of team sports as well. Was that sort of, I guess, some of the things that drew you to the sport of wrestling as well? It's probably the main thing is that, you know, uh, in team sports, there you, you could... You could always be on, you could be off, but it doesn't matter. You need other people around you yeah. to be successful. Whereas in wrestling, uh, the only person you have to blame or credit is yourself. So, uh, you know, whatever you put into it, you get out. And uh, on any given day, you know, um, you know, you, you have to put that work in. And, it, and it's you. There's no excuses. You can't rely on anybody else. Uh, there's, there's, even though you're part of a team, there's no real teammates. You're, you're, you're by yourself out there. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Now, in terms of like, just talking your transition to being so as an athlete to a coach, what would you say was the biggest challenge? Um, what was my biggest challenge? See, I was lucky is that I got to deal with a very high level of athlete right away. Is that mm-hmm. when I was done wrestling or I took breaks, um, I was able to train and work with uh, members of the Olympic team right off the bat. Um, and I think that was... You know, my, my, my greatest ability to transition was I was one of those athletes at one point. I trained with them. Mm. We had a good understanding. I was still young enough where um, they respected me, but we had some sort of camaraderie. Yeah. Um, I know what athletes go through. Uh, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily give any, you know, protocol to an athlete. I, I wouldn't have tried myself. So they know that I've struggled through and, sure. and, 
helped me a lot was I was always known as one of the hardest workers in the room. So I always pushed myself harder than everybody. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I was able to progress, you know, taking up the sport so late and be successful is, is I, I had to outwork everybody. I wasn't going to get there on, um, there's just too many guys, you know, Europeans and, and uh, Russians that were way too far ahead of you technically that you had to, to work, outwork everybody. So I think people respected me in, in, in that sense. Mm. No, no, absolutely. It no. helps, I suppose, to come from, I suppose, like an athletic background or to have, I suppose, go the path that you did to transition to coaching or does that matter? Do you think it's a factor or? Uh, it all depends on someone's personality. Obviously, you know, they're, they're the way they can, you know, the best trait as a coach is you have to be able to make your athlete uh, do what you want them to do. Mm. So, um, as, as weird as that sounds, they have to believe that what you're telling them is, is good for them mm -hmm. and beneficial to them. And, uh, so you need to have some sort of communication skills with them. Um, and they have to believe in you. And so, so the fact that, um, I could demonstrate whatever technique, you know, talking about in the gym, not, not in, on the, on the mats, but, sure. um, technique in the gym exercise, uh, I was able to show them. I was able to perform with them, but but also just that I'd suffered through it, and they uh, believed that this was good for them. Mm. No, no, great answer. And uh, what would you say, I suppose, was the main resources or people you looked up to, I suppose, in the beginning of your, I suppose, careers? You know, you were coming up in fitness. So in fitness, I was lucky. Is that I found the is actually a credit to perform better were the first real seminars I went to, we're talking about, this is going back probably close to 20 years, yeah. is um, I chose Perform Better as I just got lucky enough and that was one of the seminars, the first ones I went to. Mm. While I was there, some of the presenters that first week were uh, Mike Boyle, Gary Gray, yeah. uh, Stuart McGill. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, there was just a lot of high level Mark for Stegen. So a, hard, a lot of high level coaches that were there and I chose to follow them. There were, there were a few other fluffy guys there, but, but I was lucky enough that I believed that what they were, were saying, uh, made sense. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, you know, the Mike Boyles, the Mark for Stegans, the guys who I didn't even know at the time, yeah. but, uh, they would help me mold the early part of, uh, of my career as I was able to, you know, build a relationship with, with, uh, with Mike and, um, mm -hmm. you know, I was able to go to the, to, to, to Boston a few times to, to, um, I don't know if you want to call it mentor or, or intern. I don't, I, it wasn't really that long a period of time because I was still working with athletes, but spend time with them. And, mm. and, um, so I would say right off the bat, Mike Boyle, Mark Verstegen, when he was with, um, before it was Exos, it was, um, uh, athletes performance. Yeah. So, so those were some of the two guys that I, that I really looked up to growing up. Okay. Now, and did you always work for yourself or did you work, um, like in commercial gyms? Like, uh, yeah. Or, Cause I suppose these, like you mentioned, you kind of um, started right away working with like high level wrestlers and was that, I guess, did you just stay down that path? And then I guess that was what led to you was so running your own, your own business. It's funny, I worked at a local, you know, we call them YMHA, so like a YMCA. Yep, we And nice. I was just the, the kid who walked around with the clipboard and putting away weights. So I had the lowest job you could imagine. I was I was basically just weight room staff. I would put away weights. Mm. People had a question, I would help the, I would I would help out. You know, that was in my early early, early twenties. Yeah. And then um people liked me, I guess, and I ended up you know, even though I was training higher level guys, I, I I don't even know if I was trained the high level guys then, but I but I stepped up into a personal trainer there where mm. they rape you for money, where you're training, you know, a, a client. They're you're probably getting an 80-20 split against you. Yeah. And I built a clientele there, there, and I decided um, once I had my clientele, it was time to leave. I I had bought a a house and I and I put the I made the basement my you know my home gym where I mm. I trained clients. And I did that for a while until uh, until I bought my first studio and then just progressed uh, to bigger studio, to bigger studio, to, the, to where I am now. Mm. No, no, great. And you, do you think it's actually, uh, in terms of going back to just training, that's sort of like general population, 
Uh, do you think that's very important for someone, I suppose, that's starting, you know, who maybe wants to, you know, because some people, I suppose, when they get into fitness, they just think, you know, I want to train the elite athletes or, you know, I, I want to train the, the the best. Do you think it's very important, I suppose, to start first by training that general population first? I think people have to pay their dues. So now what happens yeah. nowadays is people just get into the business thinking they're going to be either internet celebrities, uh, you know, social media stars or train Mm. the highest level athlete right away and it just doesn't work like that and uh you could go your whole life never training you know one high high level athlete um mm. so it, it, i think people get spoiled nowadays is is when you intern or you mentor under someone who is credible they have a lot that you have access to uh a high level of clients whether it be uh professional athletes um amateur athletes mm. uh you know, whatever whatever spectrum of clientele that person has, whether it be sixty two year old uh, men, women to you know the fittest teens, you have a, you have a, an encyclopedia of, of, of knowledge in front of you. And as long as you don't get carried away and think that that's what you should be doing right off the bat, yeah. that's why I think that working, putting away weights, interning, mentoring, there, there should be a process in there where you know people develop their skills, not only socially, but, but, um, obviously intellectually and, and working hands on and, mm. you know, in a gym. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's obviously so important. Like, I mean, obviously training is one thing, but it's like building relationships because that's supposed to what we're exactly. meant to do. Yeah. Being able to communicate and talk to people and just socialize. You know, I know mm. tons of people who are very book smart, you know, they, they've, they're, they're masters, PhD. They've done every single exercise science course imaginable, like whatever conference, but Mm. They're just horrible coaches. They can't relay what they want. Uh, everything is, is off of a, what they read in a book. So there's no hands-on. There's no social skills. There's no um, uh, changing things on the fly and calling audible based on how your athlete or client feels. Everything is based on what they read in a book. And then and real life does not work like that. No, I suppose yeah. it's a good little uh, segue into my next part is – uh, I suppose fast forwarding a little bit here is, can you talk about how APC started? Yeah, so again, from my home, I moved to a small studio uh, on top of a spa where you know I still train my, my regular clients. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, I moved to uh, a studio which I called J-Sport. It was like the gym where you know things started where you saw you know uh, George St. Pierre, Chris Tang, Russell Martin, mm -hmm. like all Dennis Kang, all the, all the guys... Yeah. High level guys, everybody went through there. You know, Rashad Evans, uh, Cowboy, like everybody has been to that gym, J Sport. And um, from there, a transition to, you know, a larger scale. I, I wanted to bring a public gym that you could train like, a, like an athlete, yeah. but go to a public gym. Before, what happens is any uh, gym you went to, if you wanted to train like an athlete, being on turf, which no gyms had before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, med ball work, power work, uh, pushing sled, Sleds. agility work, whatever it was, yeah. jumping boxes, you would have to hire a personal trainer and have them run you through a workout. So you'd have to deal with only training privately. So I said, how do I bring a safe alternative to let uh, the general public come in and train like, you know, athletes or get that athletic training in and, and uh, sort of what we're exposed now to is, you know, most gyms have that that they call it functional training area. Mm. Uh, I wanted to bring it, you know, that as a whole to, to the general public. So that's how APC uh, started. Okay. And how long has it been open for? This gym here has been open eight years. Okay. Nice. Wow. Well, fresh in the uh, 10 years. Yeah. been long. That's great. Now, yeah. Um, yeah. I guess describing the, I suppose the day-to-day -day operations, um, are you quite hands-on? Like do you do all the coaching? Do you have staff? How, how does um, APC run? Uh, I'm the most hands-on coach there probably is, is that I get there at 5.30 in the morning and I'll do privates all day. Mm -hmm. And if I'm teaching class, I'm teaching classes. But it's, it's mostly we have staff that are doing privates and teaching classes. Our class schedule is probably like uh, regular hours, like a 7, 9, 12, 5, 6.30 during the day. Yeah. And um, we have a great staff that, you know, have their private training clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, the entire room is used for private training. When there are bigger classes, we, we, we cut that off. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, for the big classes, that gym is, is basically set aside just for, you know, group training. 
What sort of numbers but, are you talking um, about for the big classes? My classes I can hold in, in the summer, I can hold up to 60 people. Well, yeah, probably more if I wanted to, but we, because yeah. we'll, we'll use outside, we have the garage doors we open up. So, oh, wow. um, yeah. it, it's a good space and we can, we can sort of put each station, make three or four people per station. So you can, you can get a good, you know, you get a good 15 stations with, uh, with four people and you have a, you have 60 people in there. You know, normally we like to cut it off around 45 is a good, it's a good, it's a nice, 45 is a nice, not a nice number for us. Nice. What no. would you say makes APC stand out from the rest? There's a level of training where, um, most of the trainers there have done, you know, internships, mentorships, um, it's it's just a different camaraderie. It's it's hard to explain. It's just a family at, at APC where um, the clients all get along. It's not a huge membership where we're thousands of people and it's just a regular gym. You come in, you do your work because everybody knows each other. Mm. Um, the, the classes, people suffer together. Uh, the private training clients are sort of always around the same time. So they build a, a relationship with each other. So mm -hmm. you could be doing... Let's say uh, I could be doing a, a private training session with a few people doing a, um, you know, my clients and one of my other trainers could have a, a group of clients that get along with ours. Yeah. And just halfway through it at the end, we'll set up a sled drill where, you know, we're all meshing together, we're doing sled suicides together, we're doing skier drills together. Uh, it, it's just a, it's, it's a fun atmosphere. It makes training fun. Everybody pushes each other to be better. There's no, there's no real egos and it sort of weeds out, you know, at most gyms you have bad apples that'll, that'll come in and train and, and mm. at our gym they get weeded out right away so it's a, it's a nice it's a nice community people really really respect each other yeah no, no absolutely and do you sort of encourage I mean I mean you just kind of touched on your answer here but do you kind of encourage even your staff and yourself to kind of you know get into those those sort of workouts as well and kind of jump in and participate we love it we I, I personally take two classes a week myself mm -hmm. is I, I like the actual metabolic circuit, so I'll jump into two classes a week. But for, for, for my trainers who don't even um, participate in the classes, I'll still put them with either the athletes. Sometimes I'll train with them just to just to, to feel what it's like to to push themselves a bit. And if not, uh, they're always there to encourage. Uh, mm. You know, some some people, you know, some of the, the classes aren't for everybody. Like the conditioning classes are are very intense, and mm. some people like to lift weights, don't like to get in there and, and run on a treadmill. Or yeah. push sled or, or ski at that pace. So, but um, there's there's always um, coaches that, that like working or helping uh, all the members in the gym. Mm. Now, um, we actually you kind of touched on one of your answers, but I kind of just wanted to find out more what you credit it for. But um, you know, we hear a lot. I said the terms like functional fitness, core strength. A lot of these sort of terms kind of get thrown around. Like I wouldn't say maybe it's a gimmick, but it seemed like something that a lot of people you know use but um since probably following you about a decade ago i always noticed this sort of stuff all the stuff you kind of you've been doing this stuff for a very long time but i would say long before a lot of other gyms and fitness facilities uh what would you sort of i suppose credit that was that more i suppose your own experience that kind of exposed you to some of this training um because you did mention how you know you wanted to bring all this into a facility without privately doing it uh, yeah. So, like, what what sort of I suppose? Yeah. What do you, what do you credit that to? Well, like I, like I said, is that I was exposed to a high level of training right away where it came to. Um, I immersed myself in those coaches, and I would go to mm. back then. I would be in a seminar every month, you know. So I invested in myself back then, as I enjoyed being around there and learning from those coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to go to different. My mother was um, was. Um, a staff member at the University of Southern California at one point, so I, I did some work there with, with uh, you know, I was able to be exposed to their, their football team and the way they trained. Mm. Uh, I went to Mike's place. Um, you know, I, he was at that point, he was the BU um, hockey co uh, strength coach, so I was able to see those those coaches. I went to um, athletes' performance in, uh, at that point it was Long Beach, so I worked, you know, I got the, to... to to be around Mark Verstegen. So I was, I was able to be exposed to a lot of different, um, training principles mm -hmm. and what I took from it. I mean, the same, the same way any athlete or, or the way I wrestle is I took, you know, uh, I took pieces of, of great wrestlers and tried to build my style to myself. This the same way I, I, 
I would coach is whatever I saw that would work or that that fit my style and I tried to build one big mm. style based on all the good things. I tried to steal as much as I can to be honest. Like and, and I mean that in a in a good way is I, I tried to steal whatever I saw worked. Yeah. And whatever I saw wouldn't be beneficial. I just I didn't didn't, didn't use. Really? Now for as far as like any sort of new client or member who would walk through your doors, how would you could you describe sort of what would a um, an initial or a first session look like? Um so for private training, um, I usually because I have, you know, my eye, I've been doing it for so long. Their first session would be an assessment slash training session. Yeah. Um, and just get an idea of what fitness level they're at. Yeah. You know, obviously their injuries, what their goals are. Um, every every client should have different goals. Nobody should have the same exact goals and the same exact, you know, uh, path to what they want to do. So you have to sort of build their, their program design off of what they want and mm. what their limitations are. So training them, getting a good idea from, from what kind of fitness they're at at the same point, um, you know, just building a relationship with them right away, seeing where they want to go. And then from there, uh, you know, your, your first session is, is basically a, a workout slash assessment. And then, you know, it's just, uh, they're off and running, you know, if they want to train X amount of times a week, you know, I have, I have clients who train five days a week. Mm. And the other two days, they're doing classes. I have some clients who train twice a week and do two classes. It all depends on, you know, the volume they want to put in and, and how many days they want to be at the gym. Now, as far as that you have a cross of training athletes and also the, you know, the average normal, like general pop population, do you train them, I suppose, the same way? You know, you, you'd be surprised at how many similarities there are in those, you know, two uh, divisions. You know, a professional mm. athlete and just a regular client is – you know, a lot of the exercise selection is going to be the exact same. You know, they're going to pull, they're going to push, yeah. hip knee dominant, uh, and the conditioning. You know, obviously, from athlete to athlete, the, the major difference is the conditioning aspect of whatever their, their sport demands are. You know, obviously, a wrestler uh, or, or a, a UFC fighter will fight five minutes and get a minute break, yeah. um, and their their work rest will be sort of acyclical, means they'll have a burst of 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 energy and then you know, sort of something, um, some, some sort of active recovery, whereas mm. uh, I could have a hockey player who has a 45-second shift and then sits on a bench for six minutes. So the major difference in every every athlete you'll train is their work-rest ratio and how you're going to train them. I have football players who they're, they, they play a six-second play and then they get up to 40 seconds, you know, oh, yeah. to, to recover. Yeah, so you have very, very powerful athletes mm. who get a lot of recovery and then you have you know, athletes who who need a lot more, um, uh, who, who are just active a lot more. There, there's no recovery. There, you know, it's a five minute minute round. So mm. um, that the major difference is the conditioning aspect, uh, and obviously the, the the power. You know, some fifty year old, forty year old, thirty year old. You're not necessarily giving them Olympic lifts based on what their needs are. You know, if, mm-hmm. if someone doesn't need to, I don't need to clean anymore. I know that if, if I power clean or I hang clean, I'm going to hurt my back. I mean, it's a given with me. Yeah. If I heavy deadlift now, my back will go. So I know what my my limitations limits are and are. what my triggers are to what I get injured with. Yeah. Uh, most athletes, you know, will, will still need to Olympic lift, at, you know, to some capacity. And they're still young enough that their their bodies mm. are, are fine with it. Um, so the main thing is, is mostly the power work and the and the plyometrics and the, the jumping. You wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't want my if my average client doesn't have to do hurdles or or yeah. or, or um, high impact plyos. I would, I would keep them away from it and Olympic lifting as well. But yeah, um, you'd be surprised at the similarities of how a, a regular sixty year old woman and a, an Olympic athlete can train. I mean, they're they're you know if they can chin, if they can you know do inverted rows, if they can lunge and split squat, and you know, there's a lot of similarities. Yeah, no, that, that's a great answer. And that actually works well with my next question because observing you from afar, you have always been someone I've noticed that didn't rely on purely the big three lifts such as you know the bench press, squat, and the deadlift or Olympic lifts. I mean, I'm sure they're obviously in your programming, but um, you see a lot of, I suppose, gyms and I mean, even the gym that I work at, what I've done in the past is I've always kind of relied a lot of my training around these sort of big compound dominant movements. Um yeah, I suppose my question is why I suppose um, why I suppose you don't I suppose, rely on those sort of um, big lifts. Is that something? So, so I 
was lucky enough to be in a sport where just the workload was so high with the practices and then moving, transitioning to mixed martial arts where let's say you have George or any other athlete, they have so many practices a week where the demands on their training through having a rec- wrestling practice, uh, boxing, uh, kickboxing, uh, jiu-jitsu, um, there's just so many demands that uh, heavy back squatting was just not in the cards for a lot of the guys. You know, yeah. teaching Olympic lifting to a to an athlete who has never Olympic lifted before who has mobility issues. Mm. You know, um, if, you, if you're if you're trying to teach a snatch or a clean to someone who who can't catch, and you're dealing with someone who can't get into the proper position, yeah. you, you're just at that point you don't want to spend so much time teaching a new movement that a guy's not going to get or injure himself with. I mean, more that's the most important thing is you, you need to keep... Was that, was that more risk than the reward? Exactly. So yeah. So for guys who already knew how to, to catch or Olympic lift properly, it's great. It's a mm. great tool, especially if they don't get any um, injuries from that. But to teach a new lift where um, it's sort of like putting a, a, a square peg into a round hole or whatever that, that, that saying is, is... Mm. is you're trying to force something that doesn't necessarily need to happen. Yeah. And there's other ways I can work power. I mean, if when I first started training George, if you if you watch, we're doing um, one-arm snatch primarily as his main Olympic lift back 15, 20 years ago, yeah. or however long it was, it's been so long. But most of my guys, um, one-arm snatch, probably Rory uh, was one of the only guys who actually cleaned because his catch was good. Yeah. And I didn't have to spend a lot of time teaching the catch. And there wasn't it wasn't stressful on his body. He wasn't getting hurt. Um, whereas, whereas George, his mobility, he couldn't catch. Mm-hmm. And overhead, if I were to snatch him with a bar, um, he didn't have that shoulder mobility. So, yeah. you know, obviously we worked on getting that mobility and it was a good, good um, you know, a good testing tool. But for him to generate power, his snatch was still good. His one-arm snatch was still good. So... We would one arm snatch a lot. We do a lot of med ball work. So all the power we did was basically primarily through, you know, jump squatting, uh, plyometrics, and, uh, and and one arm snatching. So you'll you'll see that we did Olympic lift back then, but that was his Olympic lift. Yeah. Some of my hockey players, some of my hockey players went to a U.S. college, so they have good Olympic lifting form. I have no problems with them, you know, hang clean, but. To, to force an athlete to, to start learning new movements at an older age mm. and that might not necessarily fit, there's other alternatives to those big lifts like deadlifts. Yeah. You know, at, at this stage, an actual bar deadlift, I, I know my back can't handle a certain, I can go up to a certain amount of weight and then once I hit that weight, my back will go. Mm. So if you want to actually stress the system and, and, and get results, you need to start going heavier, whereas trap bar deadlifts for most athletes will work. Yeah. So I know I can go trap bar instead of bar. Back squatting for me, I've always, you know, the same idea. When I load my back a certain amount, the only way to cheat is forward. And mm. I can know I put my, my lower back at risk. Whereas front squatting, I can sort of get away with it. Single leg squatting, um, uh, split squatting, uh, rear foot elevated split squats. I know I can stress um, my body and. You know, all sports basically take place off one leg, anyways. Whereas nobody's pushing at the same time with two legs, so I can, I can still generate enough power and force off that, you know, off mm-hmm. those lifts where I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I'm getting results, and without obviously risking injury. Yeah, no, no, fantastic. Now, I suppose in terms of going into that sort of uh, exercise and you know, sort of like movement patterns, what would you say are your go-to or what you believe have the most sort of bang for your buck? So, um, you know, my favorite. I guess my, my top two that are not Olympic lifts, obviously, would be uh, I'm big into lunging and I'm big into chin-ups. Mm. Um, uh, I would say, I, I, would say I, have, I have favorites for every sort of, you know, you're looking for bang for your buck. Yes. You're looking at your big muscle groups, your back and your, your lower body. So, obviously, chins and rows would be, you know, my whether it be a one-arm row, inverted row weighted, yeah. weighted chins, and then you're looking at Lower body exercises, so uh, um, single leg deadlifts, um, walking lunges, uh, rear foot elevated split squats. Those are sort of my go-to when it comes to lower body and, and pressing. You know, we, we uh, I'm okay with dumbbell pressing or any variations of, of, of those kind of uh, mm. those presses. 
Now, um, how would you describe so as your training systems at APC? My tr- my training systems. Mm, uh, I suppose the way I suppose you train the club, the so the clientele, the members. How would you describe? Is it more uh, like do you suppose? Is there do you, do you have sort of like strength work, power, um, metabolic work? I suppose yeah. Is there a certain sort of um, protocol or something? Oh, you uh, yeah. Well, if if a client is going to do power, it's always at the beginning of their workout. So any anything that's nervous system related. So any kind of you know they'll come in. The clients will roll out, the athletes will roll out, they'll do their soft tissue work by themselves. Yeah. Um, we usually have a protocol where we have a, you know, a warm-up where they can do by themselves, where you know they come in and each person has sort of their own band drills, their own, um, yeah, sure. whether it be knee tucks, cradles, whatever a client has as their comfortable, even my athletes will have their comfortable um, warm-up, you know, their, their, cup, their comfortable activation. Mm. And then once we get into lifting and, and, and uh, you know, the workout, always power first. So uh, plyometrics will always be first, whether it be box jumping, bounding, any kind of jumping will always be first. Yep. The med ball drills, so the power drills with the med balls. So they usually, let's say, let's say a, a simple um, quad set would be a, a box jump, uh, a shot put or a side ball toss, some kind of carry. Mm. So either a suitcase carry or a farmer walk. Uh, maybe one core drill, and then something that we call prehab, which is, let's say, either shoulder mobility, hip mobility, mm. something to calm the system down to be able to, to generate power again in the first two lifts yeah. um, without really taking any time off. So the like, old bodybuilding principle would be you go to a set, you take water, you go to a set, take water. We just, just want to sort of roll through. <laughs> exactly. Because cause, yeah. cause we want to get in the most, um, the most bang for our buck in our workouts. Mm. Uh, we don't like taking too many breaks. It's not a circuit, yeah. but we're we're not doing any anything where we're competing with another, you know, muscle group. Where we still want to sort of go from from exercise to exercise, where you're fresh enough to to get the most out of that lift. Yeah. And then once we hit that first quad set or whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. whether there is Olympic lifting or or uh, weight or strength training, the next set we'll do all our strength training next. Mm. Um. So all your we will. Depending on how the, the the sequence is, in, it could be a vertical pull, yeah. a horizontal push, and let's say a, a hip dom, and then a core. And we'll put that together in another quad set, and then we'll do our conditioning all the most of the time at the end. Um, for people who want to burn a bit more fat, and, and your general public, for them, what we'll do is we'll put conditioning uh, sort of intertwined in the workout, where they'll, they'll do some intervals yeah. while they're doing their strength work. So. Um, that's another place where the client would, would be a lot different from the actual the athlete. Is most most of the time, almost always, my athletes will do their conditioning at the end of their their training. Sure. Okay. Uh, interesting. Unless they unless they come in and and they only do sprinting, it, it, sometimes they'll come doing a, a agility and sprint, and then that's their only um, their only thing they're doing that day. So okay. they'll come in, they'll do their warm up, their activation, and they'll they'll only sprint or they'll only do agility work that day. Uh-huh. No, that makes sense. Now, in terms of actually also uh, going more into that sort of training, um, why is it that you prefer more full body training as opposed to doing like body splits? I just never found, um, I never really found success in the whole upper body, lower body. Um, mm. I, I'm a big fan more of um, the vertical pulls, the horizontal pulls, mm. um, hip, knee dominant. I, I still find that you can get benefit in in training um, more joint by joint approach, and not just uh, the you know we're going to train upper body today, we're going to train lower yeah. body today. Yeah, yeah. So so it, it's worked for me. I, I like the whole full body approach. Yeah. But um, you know, I know I know a lot of people who. who uh, who still swear by upper body, lower body days, especially in, in the world of, of, uh, of hockey. But uh, I've sort of found success in, in, in this, this way of training. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, in terms of, I suppose, uh, recovery, uh, how important would you say that is in terms of getting results and also I suppose, managing uh, you know, potential plateaus that you know, a, uh, a client could experience in the training? It's huge. I mean, that's the, the biggest thing in my career is I burnt out many times is that I tried... Yeah. To catch up to everybody who was more advanced than me when it came to technique, mm-hmm. and I I just worked too hard and I burnt out or I got injured. So 
Um, I've adapted my, you know, my uh, philosophy as I'm growing older. I'm, I'm just putting in more uh, active recovery days where, you know, we'll go on a, we'll do two hard days in a row. Let's say a Monday and a Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Wednesday will be an active recovery day where they can choose whether they want to go do um, any kind of mobility work. Or whether if they some some athletes like yoga, I'm not I'm not sold on yoga, but if they like yoga, they can go do yoga. Uh, we can do. Uh, I'm big into now pool pool work for regeneration, so we'll yeah. do the sort of like a, an easy workout in the pool. Um, you know, so so I like to split up two hard days, a regeneration day two hard days, a regeneration day, and they can have sort of like a day off during the week. So definitely um, I, I've adapted more towards regen work and prehab work as I'm getting older. We're on the uh, yoga subject. I, um, I think it would have been a fair few years ago I saw you worked with um, Trish Stratus. Um, I know she's yeah. known to a yoga. i got to say you're, um, you're able to do some of those crow poses pretty well. So for someone that's not a, uh, a yoga person, yeah. <laughs> That's the, the first time I've ever been around any kind of yoga is they, they brought us together where she would do one of my workouts and yeah. I would do one of her workouts. She owned a, she owned a, a yoga studio at that point, so I went in and uh, we were both good sports about it and um, mm-hmm. I tried it out and I, I, my body for some reason does not react well to yoga. I'm so stiff yeah. that uh, I just have a tough time with it to be honest. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I suppose there's two people you credit a lot of your success to an influence. Uh, I suppose what I found really interesting is that there were probably two aspect, different aspects of your life. And that was one as an athlete and another as a coach. Um, the first you brought up his name earlier on, and that was Victor Zimmerman. Uh, can you I suppose you talk a little bit about him, first of all, and uh, let's also touch on his work in wrestling, I suppose, and what I suppose it taught you on and off the mat. Um, Victor was great. Is that When I got exposed to that Montreal Wrestling Club, um you know, my parents were divorced, so uh, I'm not sure if my mother had moved to California yet, but I lived with my father, but um, I sort of needed that father figure at the time, mm. and um, I, I was so enamored with wrestling that anything I find passion and I give, you know, 110% to. So Victor was the coach there. It was a lot of tough love, and I think because I took to it right away and he saw the potential and how hard I worked. As a coach, even nowadays, I don't know if it's, it's his effect or just just me, is that I take to athletes who love to work hard and love to be there and mm. and take criticism well. And, you know, Victor had a lot of tough love. It was, you know, he'd yell at you, he'd criticize you, yeah. um, he'd, he'd put you down, but... but mm. um, you, you knew deep down that he that he cared about you, and deep down he did care about you. And you knew what he was doing was pushing your buttons to be a better athlete. Yeah. So he knew how to to push my buttons and what 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 stirred me. Um, he pushed me is that everything I had to give I gave to him. So sure. whether it be on the wrestling mats or we used to you know um, we, we we had our conditioning through sports or through you know I would give everything and I was probably. Um, the most athletic guy on that team when it came to the sports we played. So we got along well. Uh, I pushed everybody when it came to, you know, the actual physical aspect of that. Mm. And um, he was just there. You know, you're, you're talking about a guy that when you're when you're growing up and you're you're doing three practices a day sometimes, you know, we'd go to, yeah. he was a teacher in a school. So our first practice was wake up in the morning, go to his class. We'd Whatever class he had, whether it be a wrestling, gymnastics, or a, a, a fitness to swimming class, we'd get our first workout in. So he'd be the first person I see in the morning. Mm. I might see him in the afternoon for technique, and I might see him at night for wrestling practice. So I saw Victor yeah. more than I saw my own father. And um, I just really respect um, what he's done and been able to do for so long at a, at a high level. He's, he's mm. probably one of the the greatest influences I've had in my life. It, when it comes to actual pure discipline and me waking up in the morning, every morning at 5.30 in the morning, yeah. 5 o'clock to, mm. to be at work, it's, I would credit a lot of that to him. Yeah, well, it's absolutely, it sounds like he really sort of shaped your, I suppose, mindset and work ethic. And um, as you said, he was probably able to get that sort of reaction, that response was to kind of, you know, push you to be be better. So, no, that's um, that's really interesting. Does Victor still coach? Is he still kind of um, involved? And I imagine you probably still keep in touch with him as well. Yeah, he still coaches. Um, he's still there a lot. What's great now is that 
So his son is um, sort of taking in his footsteps. His, his son's a teacher. His son's a great coach. Um, mm-hmm. David Zilberman was uh, fifth in the world, uh, I don't know what year, but very, very high-level wrestler. Yeah. It's funny because growing up, when I was when I was one of those athletes, um, his son was coming coming up and hated to to be around the wrestling you know the wrestling room. Victor didn't force him into anything. Yeah, and uh, he'd come up and play basketball with us, and you know he was the you know a kid who hated to be there, but mm. the kid, you know he pushed through it and he he, he worked hard and he, he became one of the, the, the highest uh, level wrestlers in Canada, and now he's a great coach. So it's a uh, it's interesting to see Victor's still there. Uh, if, you, if you go check out a practice, he'll be sitting watching everybody. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, another influence, uh, which I guess this name is very synonymous around the world, is GSP, uh, George St. Pierre. Um, so, you know, one of the greatest mixed martial artists that you know, we've ever seen or had. Uh, can I suppose you talk about the early days uh, of working with George and how actually you first met him? So George was was a, a part of the Montreal Wrestling Club when I was sort of at my when I, when I was retired from or on a break from training. Is, is he started going to the wrestling club to actual work on his wrestling? Yeah. Um, but he had, he, he was already at a high level. So George was um, I, I don't know if he had beaten Matt Hughes, but he was still winning. And you know I would always invite him to train with with the wrestlers at uh, at uh, my old facility, and um, he was always friendly. He always said no. And not always said no, but it was never the right time. Yeah. And then after he lost to to Matt Sarah, um, he he approached me uh, mm. regarding handling his his strength and conditioning work, and um, we sort of hit it off right away from there. Is that he gave me full reins on uh, on um, handling that you know aspect of you know planning his week regarding you know strength and conditioning, and and uh, mm. uh, he was an unbelievable athlete. Yeah, well, as far as I'm touching on his athleticism, what sort of made George stand out from the rest? Well, number one, he's a good athlete. So what happens with a lot of fighters is um, they might be good fighters, but athletically they're 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 just built in a gym where their life revolves around punching, kicking, yeah. you know, ro- or, you know, grappling work. Right. But right. athletically, they're not so fine tuned. They might not be that fast switch either. So, you know, you, you won't. There may be their their jumping mechanics aren't great. They're not great lifters. Mm. But George had a good athletic base, um, and, and was very explosive for, for for a mixed martial artist. And you know, so jumping, um, med ball work, like he took to a lot of the exercises right away. So if you showed him something, um, he would get it. And if he didn't get it, he'd work his ass off to get it by the next time you you, you saw him. Mm. So he was he was a perfectionist. If he didn't get something, uh, he'd either stick around until he got that exercise right, or even to this day, you know, even if he if if I show him something like when it comes to like let's say just a, a skater squat or something, the guy will will will, will yeah. try and master that and, and be the best at that, and 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 he won't stop until he he gets it. Now uh, I'm glad actually brought up because I wanted to double check with my. Uh I suppose a little bit of my research, but look, obviously there's been a lot of highlights, of, you know, in George St. Pierre's career, but the, um, the one I wanted to go to first was UFC 83. So he was taking on Matt Serra in a rematch. And I suppose at the time it was a pretty significant event being, I believe it was the first official UFC event in Canada. That was the Bell Center. Yeah. Uh, I suppose, can you talk about yeah. the overall experience and build up and why it was such a significant fight for George uh, so early in his career? So he had come off a loss to Matt Serra. And so Matt Serra was the champion. George um, had just been, you know, uh, TKO'd. Mm-hmm. And I think that the first match after that, he was set to fight. He fought Josh Koscheck in, in at Mandalay Bay, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And that's the first fight I worked with George for mm-hmm. on that fight. And then I hurt his back, I think. And Matt Serra was supposed to fight, I, I believe, maybe Matt Hughes. That's but right. George filled in for the interim title. He fought Matt Hughes. He beat Matt Hughes mm-hmm. in Vegas again. And then this fight, the rematch, came up um, for third fight working together is, is in Montreal. So mm. George is a, a French-Canadian kid, um, you know, a Canadian icon. Yeah. So it was... Massive, just the fact that it's the first ever fight in Canada, mm. let alone in his home uh, of Montreal, and 
and it was crazy. I mean, the the, the atmosphere was crazy to lead up. I remember just on the streets, you would have to wear disguises, you know, just, just getting around from hotel to yeah. just eating. Um, <laughs> and, and it was the loudest I've ever heard any sporting event in my life by, by, a, by a landslide. It was, yeah. you couldn't even, even if we tried to scream in the corner, you wouldn't even hear us. So it was, it was an unbelievable event. Mm. Well, I believe at the time it actually broke the um, attendance record as well. Was, I, you know, I'd imagine because... Uh, before most of the events took place at Mandalay Bay MGM Grand, um, mm. those arenas in Vegas, um, and most of those arenas fill, um, you know, let's say 12,000, 13,000. Um, and and for, for any fight night around, I'm guessing if they had them, they usually you do a half, half dome where they, they cut the arena sort of in half or cut the top seats yeah. off. And this one was standing room only, the was probably 21, 22,000 people. Mm-hmm. Now, in terms of, because obviously, yeah, for yeah, those definitely, who don't, yeah, for those who don't know, he won, What's that? Of, uh, for those who don't know, he won an outstanding fashion. Um, uh, I suppose, the, uh, would you say this loss that he had early in his career was probably like, oh, not necessarily the best thing that happened to him, but do you think it was very vital in terms of his career, in terms of where, it, very crucial where it went on from there, because from that loss, he, if anything, he just got better and better. Like I feel like it was a real turning point. A hundred percent. I mean that that loss. Um, he, he, I don't know. I, I can't talk about his passion before, mm. but definitely never letting up in the way you approach uh, fight camps is. I don't know if he would tell you that his fight camp for the Matt Sarah fight wasn't the greatest, but I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, um, to where he took every day. In, you know, as a business where, you know, he's going to make sure that you never walk to the, you never want to walk to the octagon um, thinking that you didn't put in the work. So yeah. he'll tell you on any given night, any fighter can win. It doesn't matter who you're fighting. It's not necessarily the best fighter that will win. It's, it's the fighter that fights the best on that given night. Correct. And um, so, but the, the, the best thing you can do is prepare yourself optimally so that when you get in that, you know, when you're walking down that that uh, that aisle, you, you know that you've prepared yourself the best, and that mm. you don't have any you know second second doubts, questions that that you're not prepared. So that's the most important thing is being mentally prepared, knowing that you've done all the work leading up to that event. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, are there any sort of other sort of personal highlights of George that sort of stand out in his career? Um, I re- you know the the BJ Penn fight was was unreal. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because of the whole feud they had and mm. the sort of the, the dislike. It was the first fight, really. Um, you know, Matt Hughes, George looked up to. Matt Sarah was sort of a comedian, uh, uh, but, it, you know, there was still dislike, but they, they ended up being, you know, respectful at the end, which was, was, was great. Yeah. Um, but BJ Penn was the first one where they, they sort of, you know, there was dislike, um, there was trash talk mm. uh, to an, Another level. They had a prime time, you know, the prime. Absolutely, time, yeah. Uh, came up also. I think um, it, w- it was something that that had never been done before. And just leading up to, I know that it was huge. I, I know they had fought to a split decision before. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just, you know, BJ was was an icon at that point. Mm-hmm. It was it was a, a huge fight. So I would say that would be a highlight. Uh, UFC 100 against uh, Tiago Alves. I think would, yes. was in. I want to say MGM, uh, Mandalay or MGM, but again, another, you know, fantastic. Well, in terms of, yeah, in terms of finishing on George, um, would you sort of like to see him return and face someone like Khabib uh, or another sort of super fight, you know, or maybe potentially try to get a third belt? Def- definitely not a third belt, and they wouldn't even let him. They, they UFC would never let him. Um, they, they know the risk in that is that they, they don't want someone to hold up a division by winning a belt, and he. You know, the Khabib fight, I know Khabib wants it, and, and George would have taken it. Mm. Um, but again, the UFC, they you know, they don't want to risk if George comes in and, and beats Khabib. And then all of a sudden, you have George who's not going to go back to lightweight, and, and, and he doesn't want to defend time. He just wants stuff that's going to excite him. And at this point, you know, he, he, he doesn't need it. He doesn't need the money. He's successful. He's, he's, he's content in his life. Um, mm. I think that Khabib was the only fight out there that that, that made sense to him, and, and if that's not going to happen, there's no use in him uh, 
there's no use in him coming back and and uh, it it takes so much now to for for someone to, to get up for a for a fight. There's so many young guns out there. They're they're living in dorms. They're you know mm. George is, is is set for life and he, he doesn't need to fight. Yeah, his legacy is set. He doesn't need to fight anymore. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's yeah, set in stone for sure. All right. Uh, so going back on the um, present, uh, I suppose, how, I suppose, have you been, I suppose, managing the challenge that's sort of like we're currently in at the moment with your, I suppose, your members and uh, your, and I guess yourself personally? Uh, well, the members is tough. You know, you have to refund them their money if, uh, you know, when we didn't know how long it was going to be originally, we could have, you know, you could just apply two or three weeks off if not, you know, I was still giving classes online. Mm. So, you can justify it, but now we're, you know, going on, you know, over two months or getting to two months worth. And, uh, so the gym is making no revenue. Uh, myself, I'm doing privates with, you know, my clients that I can see, but it's, it's, it's a lot, uh, it's actually a lot more demanding doing it via phone. It's a, uh, it's a lot tougher uh, challenge when it comes to mm. giving privates to certain screens. Oh. Uh, what advice, I suppose, would you give to someone, I suppose, that's sort of struggling with motivation to sort of train or um, even, you know, I guess follow a diet or yeah, be a bit more, you know, uh, disciplined, I suppose, with their diet or anything during their, I guess, this period? You know, it's it's a tough time, obviously, and it's depressing, but um, for myself, I find there's no there's no excuse for you, especially during this time, not to be in shape or or be following some sign uh, the, the diet's a bit tougher because if you're at home a lot and you're you know you want a snack for myself I'm finding it very easy to follow I don't eat till 12 at least mm. I just I'm not even trying to intermit fast I just uh, I work all morning and then I um, by the time I'm finished doing my my uh, my live class or, or my morning sessions then I'll go get my food so I eat you know a pretty big meal for lunch and then mm. Uh, I won't eat again until uh, until dinner. I'm eating a lot of calories, like I'm I'm I'm, but I'm not really snacking. I'm not. I don't have the uh, the urge to snack. And with the training, I mean, I have access to a gym, so I'm spoiled. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there's there's now nowadays there's a million free workouts you can do online. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can do some body weight stuff. It, it's tough. You know, I uh, I could say you know everybody has a you know as a way to, to stay in shape, but when you're used to training in a big gym like this, you have every every um, sort of equipment or or anything you'd need, and then you're in a in a house and you're not really able to do anything. It's mm. it's tough. I would say it's a, it's a lot tougher now. Yeah, and just going a little bit on back to yourself. So obviously, it sounds like you're very back to back. Uh, is that more so? Just I guess a from a time point of view that you don't really um, are able to, I suppose, to have I suppose like breakfast or like I suppose a meal or um, yeah, or is that just sort of like just how it sort of just ends up working out? For me, my, my, my profitable, like I'm, I'm very profitable in the morning. So mm. if I can see four or five people at six o'clock in the morning and, you know, and seven and eight and nine and, mm. you know, people sometimes come in on the half hour. So they're always streaming in where every, I'm treating everybody a bit differently. Um, I can manage that very easily at my gym and I don't feel the need to, uh, you know, I have a coffee in the morning, let's say first thing, and uh, you know my day is pretty easy. I wake up max five o'clock in the morning. I pray, and then I I start my day till at least twelve or one straight. I don't take any breaks. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll take a break. I'll eat. Hopefully, I'll train myself, and I, I go back to work at three thirty mm. to whenever I finish. Well, it sounds like you're, um, I suppose, you're very sort of like regimented. It kind of goes into like a really good. Um, well, my next question kind of goes into that as well. Is um, I suppose one thing that I suppose a lot of people sort of struggle with is that sort of, I guess, work-life balance. Uh, probably a little bit different in the circumstances we're in at the moment. But uh, what would you say? Uh, I suppose the key things that you're able to I suppose. Uh, I guess make things work because obviously I know obviously you. You're a family man. You have kids. Uh, obviously, you have a business. Obviously, I suppose have your own sort of personal time or downtime. How I suppose are you able to balance all that? Like, uh, what's a day a day of yours look like? Well, luckily I have Maddie with me, so um, I will never see. You know, I, I'll rarely see my kids in the morning ever because I leave to work. Let's say at four thirty-five in the morning, mm. so they're hopefully sleeping. Sometimes my youngest is up, but so I'll never be able to eat breakfast with my kids, and and that's one thing I've had, had to give up. But um, you know, on days when it can work, if I can 
go pick them up from school, uh, do an activity with them, um, you know, spend time with them at night, you know, do some homework with them. Those are the important parts. And on the weekends, um, you know, once I'm finished, my, I, I only really work in the, you know, from, let's say, seven in the morning, six in the morning on the weekends till let's say, lunchtime. I have the rest of the day to spend with them or, you know, do activities. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I have to give up the breakfast, you know, every day. But other than that, you know, you, you just try and fit everything in, see what's important. I'd rather, you know, it's, I would have, wouldn't have done it before because I'm a workaholic, but now, you know, it's important to take, to pick your kids up some, from school sometimes to, uh, even if you can find someone else to do it, it's good to do it sometimes, go to all their, you know, their school events and, uh, you know, it, it, it's very important to their, uh, to their shaping. Mm. Would you say that kids have got kind of changed your life in that sort of aspect in terms of, um, cause you sound like a very work focused. Yeah. hundred percent that the kids like really. Like I used to work nonstop. I never took a vacation ever, never took a day off. And now, um, you know, like I've taken them to, to Disney World. Uh, we're able to spend time together. I, you know, I'd rather see them than, you know, jam an extra, you know, hour of work into my day. So mm-hmm. definitely, uh, I'm still a workaholic, but they, they def- definitely put um, some, um, you know, they've calmed me down a lot when it comes to that kind of stuff. Mm. No, fantastic. Now, uh, I suppose looking a little bit into the future, I suppose uh, in regards to APC and yourself personally, is there any sort of anything you're sort of working on at the moment or sort of planning? I suppose in the next sort of six to twelve months. Um, I just see that there's the, the online aspect of training and the virtual um, aspect of training. It's going to start taking off because people are going to be nervous to go to gym. So we're going to have to develop. You know, being able to luckily, you know, out of no uh, objective of our own, we, we were just wanted to give free classes to the, the people and it just took off. So now we have such a big following with people who want to, you know, keep training with us from afar mm. or they can't get to the gym that, you know, we'll have that ability to train virtually when this is all over. And then probably I'm lucky is that I make more money from doing, let's say, um, you know, my, my personal training, my privates is, is a good chunk of, of, of my living. Mm-hmm. So teaching classes and, um, you know, large scale things aren't, aren't huge on my, for the gym, it will struggle, but I, I can still make a living, but the gym probably won't be able to do as many people in a, in a room as possible when it comes to, you know, I do a class for 45 people easily mm-hmm. and I don't, I don't know that they'll allow that. Okay. All right, fair enough. Now I suppose going to some closing questions, uh, that's one of the first ones. Is what's um, one thing you wish you had learned uh, as was early on in your career? Um, I think I think the regeneration aspect of training, where where the rest and the um, recovery. Uh, you know, even in my career, I, I didn't. I, I burnt out many times when it came to actual training because I, I would just I did too much. Mm-hmm. And same thing with you know my athletes is is we always went really hard, but we didn't really have any regeneration days. Mm. Um, and now it's definitely in, in all our program design. So I, I'd say regeneration and, and uh, recovery is mm-hmm. definitely the most important thing in, in, in my career that, that's uh, changed. I wish I would have learned it earlier. Okay. No, that's a good answer. Uh, I suppose, and in terms of advice, um, for someone, I suppose, who wanted to pursue a career similar to yours, uh, what advice would you give them? Find as many mentors and, and do as many internships as possible. Mm-hmm. There's only so much you can read in a book and, and study in a school is that you need to actually be around people, be around athletes, uh, be around coaches, um, learn different um, styles of coaching, see which one, you know, fits your style the most and see what you can take to, you know, steal as much as you can. Now, um, a little bit of a curveball question. I kind of throw this out to every, uh, every person, but say you were the podcast host. What question would you ask yourself that I haven't already asked you? <laughs> and you have to answer it, of course. That's, what question? Who is the... That's, that's, a good, that's actually a very good question. Um, I have to be objective. Uh, who <laughs> would you say is... Or what is the greatest... I already answered that, though. The greatest sporting event you've ever been to. Who is the? It's a, it's a tricky question. Mm, no, no, no. Um, actually, it's not even a good question. You know what? That's that's such a tricky question. I don't even know how to. I don't even know what I would ask myself. 
would I ask myself? Here's a good question. If you could pick any sport or any achievement that, um, oh, I, would even, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. That is a, it's normally not a bad thing. Maybe it means I've done my job if, well. Here you go. If you, if, you, if, you could, if you could go back and change any path in your, in your life or career, what would you have changed? Okay. And I wish I would have tried maybe a bit harder maybe a couple more years to see if I could, um, you know, succeed on the world level when it came to athletics, uh, either world championships, Olympic, whatever. Just put in a few more years of, of hard work and see how far it would have taken me. I always burnt out. Um, I, I always burnt out and I always had, you know, injuries. But um, some of the guys that I, that I beat on the way up, you know, either stayed with it or, and they, uh, they ended up going to the world championships. They were national champions many times over. Uh, you know, they, they went to some Olympic games. So it's, yeah, I would like to see if I would have actually stuck with, you know, Victor and the, and the Montreal Racing Club. Uh, mm. I, I would have turned out. Yeah, just a little bit on that. Because, you know, I know you started wrestling at a, um, at a later age. Do you think if you had started it a little bit younger, that could have had, I guess, a impact? Oh, 100%. 100%. 100%. I picked it up very quickly. <clears throat> Luckily, I had good athletic genes from, um, you know, from my parents and whatever, you know, I, I did growing up, and that was the sport that I really could have excelled in uh, at a very high level. Like I took it far for someone who started so late. So I would have liked to see, you know, uh, even at at fifteen, sixteen, if I would have taken it up, mm-hmm. it would have been a, a whole different story because I had good training partners. I had good mentors I had good people around me that, that uh, I could have gone for good answer. Mm. now um, where um, where can people I suppose find out more about you uh, do you have I suppose like a social media like a website um, your own um, like personal page or the gym itself where can people connect with you uh, the Instagram of, of my Instagram Jonathan Schoenberg I think it's I think it's Jonathan Schoenberg at, uh, you would know Jonathan Schoenberg I think uh, John, John Chamber. Chamber yeah, John. Oh, there you go. Is, is it John Chamber? Yeah, it may be John Chamber. John Chamber. Yeah. I, I think it's John. It's not, yeah. So John Chamber. Um, I'm not really active on Facebook. I'm sort, sort of not really good with social media, so I have to pick one that I can concentrate on. And Instagram seems to be the one that I uh, that I'm on most of the time. So it would be Instagram. Uh, APC Jim has an Insta- uh, Instagram page as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll be working. We're actually going to work on our website now. Because, uh, you know, General Performance Center has its own website, but I'm, you know, now that we're having this little break in, in uh, society, I'll, I'll have some time to uh, work on building my own website. I never really worked mm-hmm. on it, but uh, I think it's a good time to, to launch it. Sounds like a pretty common thing uh, for most uh, trainers. It's kind of like working on, I suppose, the things, especially the uh, that back end or admin or uh, the stuff that we sort of don't like to do because, you know, we always like to mainly be yeah. on, the, on the floor and, and um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, I, I never, I never work on anything related to social media. So now, finally, I, I'm starting to push it a bit. You know, I'm doing these live workouts. I'm, I'm posting a bit more, but it's tough. It's challenging. Mm. And the gym itself, where, where is it um, located? Exactly. Uh, it's in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Um, if you know Montreal, it's probably like uh, uh, in TMR, so town of Mount Royal. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but. Uh, yeah, it's, it's centralized in in, uh, in Montreal. Okay, no, fantastic. All right, so uh, before we sign off, we have our signature Revo PT question. So just going to ask you a series of questions, uh, short responses, quick rapid fire, ready to go. Let's do it. All right. All right. Squat or deadlift? Uh, trap or deadlift. All right. No, no. <laughs> Row or ski? Uh, oh, ski. Assault bike or sled? Good question. Sled. <laughs> dumbbells or kettlebells? Uh, dumbbells. Skater squats or pistol squats? Skaters. Drive or navigate? <laughs> uh, drive. Nice. Baseball or hockey? Uh, well, I was a re- I was actually a really good baseball player growing up, but uh, hockey. Okay. Ooh. Baseball's a bit boring to watch. Yeah. Uh, best Wi-Fi name you have seen. Best, sorry, what? Best Wi-Fi name you have seen. Oof. I don't know. I, I don't even. I'm so bad with with computers and 
I'm telling you, me with with uh, I wouldn't even know. Like I, I go on mine, I don't even know how to sign into to, to Wi-Fi myself. Okay, so fair enough. Well, we'll pass well, that one. Like, usually, it's just Videotron five eight something something. <laughs> We, 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 we don't have, like, we're so bad when it comes to that. Yeah. No, no, fair enough. All right. Two movies everyone should watch. Um, Goodwill Hunting and Kill Bill. Okay. Oh, good movies. Most annoying habit. Uh, I bite my nails badly down, down to till they bleed. Me too. That's a, yeah. Okay, I feel you there. Uh, favorite cuisine? Cuisine? Mm-hmm. Um... I like I like a good a good steak, good steaks, sushi and steak. Sushi and steak. Oh, very good. Well, I'm guessing this could be next one. Uh, favorite cheat meal? Uh, I don't cheat that much, but if if I'm gonna cheat, sweet potato fries. Okay. Uh, burgers or tacos? Burgers. I don't. I don't need. I don't need either. But if I'm gonna eat anything. It's gonna be a burger. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, three things that you can't live without. My kids, my wife, and my gym. <laughs> that just sums you up very well. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, three things, uh, three things that you would take on a desert island. Um, my phone, surprisingly, um, a chin up bar, and uh, uh, some sort of ball that I could throw around with someone if, if I was alone. And uh, I don't know, a boomerang. <laughs> 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 Here we got those. All right, last two. Okay, if you were the president of the United States for one day, what would you do? Fire the presidency of the United States right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. All right, if you if you weren't a fitness trainer, you would be a professional athlete. Very good. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, on the Your Revolution podcast, episode 114. Uh, I'll give you the uh, final word. Anything you'd like to, uh, to finish with? No, that's great. Thank you for having me. And uh, uh, I really uh, hope one day I can visit Australia. I uh, have a lot of athletes out there and I, uh, I would love to come see it. No, no, absolutely. Like I so said, you're always welcome to come to Melbourne. If you're here, and uh, I'll have to, I actually haven't haven't been to uh, Montreal. I've been to the, the other side of Vancouver a few times, but um Yes, I do come to Canada. I will have to uh, come check you guys out. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Open invitation. No, thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Your Revolution podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe so you are notified when a new episode is posted. Like all episodes, I hope you are leaving with some great things that can help you in your life and journey through health and fitness. Get after it, and as always, train with purpose.